Hey folks. Recording here the last session for the semester. It's chapter 11. I bet this is probably going to be maybe probably two videos. All right. It's been a great semester, folks. I appreciate your hard work, all right? I know it's been tough. Keep it strong, keep it going, okay? Okay, let's get this thing going. Okay, so chapter 11. Um, so like I said, this is gonna be real short. Um, I will review the learning goals. Um, I forgot to open up that document, so I'll review the learning goals in the next video. Um, so there's also some kind of nice review here of solution concentration units. Um, so that's what this last final chapter is about, solutions. Um, so let's just have a, a nice review, reminder of all these solution concentrations. Um, so there's mass percent, um, which would be mass of solute over mass of solution. So don't forget those definitions of solute, solvent, and solution. So let's write that down. Solute, solvent, and then solution. So typically the solute um, is what we mix into a liquid to be dissolved that we call the solvent. And combining those two things makes the solution. Okay. Um, so we've used molarity quite a bit this semester. Moles of solute per liter of solution. But uh, we're going to introduce one new um, uh, solution concentration, which is molality. So molarity and molality are just slightly different. Okay. So molarity is moles of solute per liter of solution. Molality is moles of solute per kilogram of solution. So to convert molarity to molality, we need the density, okay? Um, so I'll give you an example. So suppose we have a, um, let's just say a one molar solution of something like, you know, NaCl, okay? So we can say that the solute is NaCl and the solvent is H2O. Well, to convert from 1.0 molar NaCl to molal, so I'll write that down, molal, so we would say like, what's the molality or you know, how many molal is the solution, we would have to know the density of this NaCl solution. So it's not the density of the solvent water, it's going to be the density of the sodium chloride solution. So suppose that density, so Greek letter rho for the Na solution, NaCl solution, let's suppose it's 1.02 gram per cubic centimeter. So now how do I convert that molarity into molality? Well, we can say that that's 1.0 moles of NaCl, so we have that established. But now we need to know the kilograms of solution, okay? Well, we know from the molarity that it was one liter of solution, right? And so uh, we know that that one liter is 1,000 cubic centimeters, which is the same as 1,000 milliliters, right? And then finally, we recognize here from the density of that solution that it was, um, let's see here, one cubic centimeter and 1.02 grams. However, we recognize it's got to be kilograms of solution so then finally, I can say in 1,000 grams, there's one kilogram. So my one molar NaCl solution will have the following molality. 
So it's going to be 1 times 1 times 1 times 1,000. Um, so that's all 1,000 divided by uh, 1 times 1,000 times 1.02 1 times 1. So 1,000 divided by 1,000 is 1. Divided by 1 1.02 gives me 0.98. So my 1.0 molar solution will be 0 0.98 and we use a little m molal. And so you might be thinking those are very similar so why does it matter? Well when the density of our solution is much different um, than the density of let's say pure water then it does make a big difference. Okay so but all the same we should you should be able to convert from molarity to molality. And we have to remember this process of doing dimensional analysis. So this is good review at the end. Um, we're also going to use mole fraction um, for solution compositions. And we remember mole fraction is going to be the number of moles of thing A, whatever you know this thing is, um, divided by the total number of moles. So if we were to think about um, you know, what is my mole fraction of sodium chloride in this solution, um, I already know the number of moles of NaCl, 1.0, but then what I would have to do is calculate the number of moles of NaCl plus the number of moles of water, right? So my total would be number of moles of species A, the solute, plus the number of moles of the solvent. And I'll have a couple of sample calculations for this coming up, okay? So, first thing I want to talk about with solutions is vapor pressure lowering due to the presence of dissolved solutes, okay? Um, so, and that's what this says right here. Aqueous solutions always have a lower vapor pressure than pure water when the solute is non-volatile. So, what does non-volatile mean? It means it has no vapor pressure. So typically that means it's a solid. Now, as it turns out, some solids can have vapor pressure. Um, it's very small, the vapor pressure of solids, incredibly small. So we don't really worry about the vapor pressure of the solid when we're talking about, um, you know, the vapor pressure of a solution with a dissolved solid. So if I draw a couple pictures here to show you what's really going on, what's at play, so suppose I have a beaker of just pure water. And then now suppose I have a beaker of an aqueous solution of sodium chloride. So basically all I've done here is added, you know, add some solid NaCl. Well, this water, as we know, is going to evaporate and create vapor pressure. So I'll say that that's P0 solvent. So that's the vapor pressure of the solvent. But now when I add sodium chloride in here, I'm going to get a new vapor pressure of this solution that I'm going to call P uh, solution using my little abbreviation right there. And so because this chi solvent, so the mole fraction of the solvent will always be less than one. So that means now that the vapor pressure of the solution for a solution made up of a solvent and a non-volatile solute, like a solid, means there will always, the vapor pressure of the solution will always be lower than the vapor pressure of the pure solvent, okay? So let's do a sample calculation here. So a solution is made by dissolving 154 grams of sucrose, so that's table sugar, right? Which is definitely non-volatile, it's a solid, in one liter of water. Calculate the vapor pressure of the solution at room temperature, assuming the vapor pressure of water at this temperature is 17.5 torr. Okay, great. So we can already say that P solvent equals 17.5 torr. So now what we need to do is calculate 
the mole fraction of the solvent. Okay? So we can do that by first noting that I've got um, 154 grams of sucrose. And here, instead of giving you the formula of sucrose, I was nice, I just gave you the molar mass. So we know that's 342.3 grams of sucrose in one mole. So let's just calculate that, how many moles of sucrose we have. So 154 divided by 342.3 equals, okay, great. So I've got uh, 0 0.4, let's say 50 mole of sugar. Now what I need to do is calculate my moles of solvent, okay? So let's see, I'm going to say um, in, uh, I'll say in solute equals this, and I'll define chi solvent as the following. It's the number of moles of solvent divided by the number of moles of solvent plus the number of moles of solute. Right, because the number of moles of solvent plus the number of moles of solute will give me the total number of moles. Okay, so there we go. So now to calculate in solvent, the number of moles of solvent, we recognize that it's 1.00 liters of water. And always as a good assumption, pure water is one gram per cubic centimeter, 1.00 grams per cubic centimeter. So here, my one liter of water um, I know that one liter is 1,000 milliliters or 1,000 cubic centimeters, same thing, right? And I also recognize here that um, uh, water is one mil per one gram, the density, okay? So let's write that down, um, 1.00 grams per milliliter. And then finally, because I'm converting this into number of moles, I know water is 18.01 grams per mole, right? One oxygen plus two hydrogens. Okay, and let's see what I get from there. So I get um, one times a thousand is a thousand times one times one, right? And then so now that's a thousand divided by one times one times 18.01. So divide by 18.01 and I get 55.5 uh, moles. 0.5 moles. So now my mole fraction of solvent is going to be equal to 55.5 divided by 55.5 plus 0.450. Um, so let's say, so 55.52, I'll just leave this answer in the calculator. So plus 0 0.450 equals, um, and now I'm going to do a little handy trick. I'm going to push the one over button and then say times 55.5 equals, and I get a mole fraction that is 0 0.992. So it's close to one, but all the same, it's still less than one. So finally, the vapor pressure of my um, solution is going to be chi solvent times the vapor pressure of the solvent, which is going to be 0.992 times, that was a big Lego mess that just got spilled, <laughs> that no doubt you heard. Uh, you okay there, buddy? Yeah. Okay. So then 0.992 times 17.5 equals. Um, so with the three sig figs, you can see it really hasn't changed the vapor pressure very much. I'm going to call it 17.4 torr. Okay. So not a whole lot of difference in the vapor pressure of the solution. However, if we would have put significantly more sugar, if we would have added more sugar, we would have seen more and more depression of that vapor pressure, okay? Um, so now, what happens if we make a solution of two things that are both volatile? 
So for example, maybe something like alcohol and water. Alcohol definitely has a vapor pressure. Water definitely has a vapor pressure. Okay. So the calculation gets a little bit more complicated. So we have to now calculate the mole fraction of A and the mole fraction of B. We have to multiply those mole fractions by their respective pure vapor pressures, add them together, and now that's going to give us the vapor pressure of the new solution. Okay, so again, this version of Raoult's law applies to solutions made of two volatile components. So basically what that means is two liquids, if I mix two liquids together, okay? So let's do a sample calculation. So a solution is made by mixing 45 mils of ethanol, so that's alcohol, with 123 mils of water at room temperature. Calculate the vapor pressure of the solution, assuming ethanol has a vapor pressure of 5.95 kPa, kilopascal, and water has a vapor pressure, so the same 17.5 torr. Okay. So the first thing to notice is that um, we have to have those pressure units the same. And it doesn't really matter if we convert to kilopascals or torr, they just both have to be the same. So I'm going to convert this 5.95 kilopascal into tor, okay? So um, I recognize from my little chart here, right, that you, you know, you always have these numbers on an exam. I'm not going to make you memorize them. Uh, 101.325 kilopascal is the same as 760 tor. Um, so let's say 760 divided by 101.325 equals, and uh, let's see here, did I? Oh, and then I have to multiply by 5.95, and then times 5.95 equals. Okay, great. So that's 44.6 torr. Okay, so, and let's see here. You know, what's also missing is I didn't give you the density of ethanol. So that I would definitely have to give you. So the density of ethanol is, um, we'll use, I got uh, 0.786 grams per milliliter. And we recognize the density of water is 1.00 grams per milliliter. Okay. So we'd have to have both densities of these liquids. So now first I'm going to calculate the number of moles of ethanol, which I abbreviate as ETOH. Okay. And so that's going to be my 45 milliliters times now. So my density says, uh, let's see here, one milliliter is 0 0.786 grams. And then now I gave you the formula. So um, you'll need to remember how to do molar mass, right? So the mass of two carbons plus the mass of... Uh, three, five, six oxygens plus, or hydrogen, excuse me, plus the mass of an oxygen, I get 48.07. Make sure you get something close to that. Uh, 48.07 grams in one mole. Okay, beautiful. So when I do that, now I've got here um, 45 milliliters times 0.786 divided by 48.07 equals 0.736, uh, let's say. So 0 0.736 mole. I'm going to go one digit past my number of significant digits, um, and then I'll estimate my sig figs at the end. Okay. So then now i got to figure out my moles of water, which I can do the exact same way. So 123 milliliters of water so I know the density of water is one milliliter in 1.00 grams. And my molar mass of water is 18.01 grams in one mole. One, two, three, 123 mils times one times one, and then uh, divided by 18.01. Hopefully I did that correctly. Yep. So now that's 6.8 three moles of water. 
And so now I can say my mole fraction of ethanol is going to be the number of moles of ethanol divided by the number of moles of water plus the number of moles of ethanol. So I'll write that out. I'll say N E T O H divided by N E T O H plus N H 2 O. And so that's going to be 0.736 mole divided by 0.736 mole plus 6.83 mole. Okay. So I'm going to leave this number in the calculator and I'm going to say plus 0.736. I'm going to do this handy 1 over x trick and then say times 0.736 equals. Um, and let's see, for my ethanol, that looks right, I get a mole fraction of 0 0.0973. Okay. And now there's a couple things I could do. I could calculate the mole fraction of water in the same way, or I could recognize the mole fractions have to add up to 1. Right? So let's calculate it in the same way that we did for ethanol, and I'll know that I did it correctly if both of those mole fractions add up to 1. Okay? So that's going to be the number of moles of water uh, divided by the number of moles of water plus the number of moles of ethanol, which is going to be 6.83 moles, divided by the same thing, 7 point, or 0.736 plus 6.83. Okay, so let's see what we get. So I'm going to say 0.736 plus 6.83 equals uh, 1 over x times 6.83 equals and here we go. I get 0 0.903. Um, so I think we did this correctly because now if I say plus 0 0.0973 equals 1.000. Great. Okay. So um, if you want to make a shortcut on calculating mole fraction where you have to calculate both, you now know you only have to calculate one and then subtract that number from 1.000, okay? And so now finally I can say uh, the vapor pressure of the solution equals, it's going to be, um, so mole fraction of ethanol is 0 0.0973 times its vapor pressure, which was 44.6 torr, plus the mole fraction of water, 0 0.903, times its vapor pressure, 17.5 torr. And let's see what we get here. So that's going to be 0 0.0973 times 44.6. Okay. So um, that's going to be 4.34 torr plus 0 0.903 times 17.5 equals, um, and that's 15.8 torr. Okay, so adding these together, plus 4.34 equals, and I get, um, with the correct sig figs, that's going to be 20.1 torr. So there was a fairly significant change to the vapor pressure of water with this ethanol solution. The vapor pressure increased. And that's because ethanol has a much higher vapor pressure than does water. Okay? So all of this stuff that we've done are what we call colligative properties. Okay? So, and what colligative property means is it's a property that depends on the collection. Um, and no, I'm not talking about the Borg. I'm not going to assimilate you. Um, so this collection, it, it really means like uh, the number of things in solution. Okay, the more things that we have in solution, um, the more significant are these colligative properties. So examples of colligative properties: vapor pressure lowering, like we just talked about, and the other two important ones that we'll talk about: um, boiling point elevation. 
freezing point depression and then the last thing that i forgot to include on this list osmosis ok so osmosis is definitely dependent on how many things are dissolved in solution ok um, and so i'm going to end it here and i'm going to pick up right here um, for the next lecture so we can have kind of two uh, final lectures here about 30 minutes each uh, ok folks i'll see you in the next one